All right, let's get started. If you're wondering what that voice was, that was a fellow student uh, who shall not be named because this is a video. Say hi, random student. Hello. All right. <laughs> we should give extra credit, see if you can guess who that was. All right. Uh, we're going to do the review guide today. Uh, it shouldn't take too long, and I'm going to do a step-by-step -step process for how to do it. Okay. Try to brighten this up. All right. Ollie has installed security lights on the side of his house that are activated by a sensor. This sensor is located at point C directly above point D. The area covered by the sensor is shown by the shaded region enclosed by this triangle. The distance from A to B is four and a half meters and the distance from B to C is six meters. Angle ABC, A, that should be ACB, oops. Um, ACB is 15 degrees, that's a typo, it should be ACB. Find CAB. All right, so when you're looking at this sort of thing, you want to be careful to uh, check everything out. So CAB, and let's just zoom in, make sure we're good here, is that guy. All right, this is a non-right triangle. Okay, which means... Um, smaller non-right triangle so that means we should be figuring out whether we should use the sine rule or the cosine rule if they give you an opposite side with an opposite angle you should use the sine rule otherwise you should use the cosine rule since we have 15 degrees and 4.5 we should definitely be doing the sine rule so going over here we've got the sine of 15 degrees over 4.5. So that's opposite over opposite will equal opposite over opposite. So this time it's the sine of A over 6. Okay. Now, solving for A, you're going to get a uh, sine inverse of, let's see, 6 times the sine of uh, 15 degrees Ooh. over 4.5. All right, which should equal what? All right, so I'm gonna take out my calculator, make sure I'm set to degrees, so I go to mode, switch it over to degrees, sine inverse with a fraction, six times the sine of 15 degrees over 4.5. And I get 20.187. Cool. And that's that guy. All right. So that means this right here is 20.187. Jeez, I can't type. Degrees. All right, moving right along. That's 20.187 degrees. Now, point B on the ground is five meters from point E at the entrance to Ollie's house. And he is 1.8 meters tall and is standing at point D below the sensor. And he walks to point B. Woo, that's a mouthful. So why don't we take our time and actually figure out what this is? All right, what zoom are we at? We're at 150, so we can go back if we need to. All right. All right, so looking at this guy, uh, point B is five meters from point E, so we should probably write that down. So here, we're at point two. Let's zoom in again a few times. This whole guy right here is five meters. Okay. Uh, one other thing, Ollie is 1.8 meters tall, and he's going to walk all the. He's going to walk all the way to point B, but we want to know what's the distance that Ollie is from the house when he first activates the sensor. So this is, you got to read in between the lines a little bit. 
but ultimately what's going on here is he is going to hit this guy right about here. That's when he first touches the sensor. And when he reaches this point, he is going to be 1.8 meters tall. Okay? So if this big guy is 5 meters, um, we need to try to figure stuff out in order to figure out what exactly we're trying to figure out. Let's do blue. Escape. Nope. How do I get out of here? Right, that was weird. I need to figure out essentially this distance right here. Which means if I know what this distance is here, then I'm good. Right? If I can figure out this distance right here, then I'm good. All right, well, let's try to figure out that distance. So I need to know what is that distance there, x. Okay. Well, looking at this carefully, this is a right triangle, right? Uh, if I knew an angle inside this triangle, I should be good. Maybe there's a way that I can do that. All right, so let's take a look. Maybe, all right, if I knew what this angle was, I'd be good which means if I know what this angle is, I should be really good. And since all the angles of a triangle add up to 180, I could say 180 minus that minus that, and that'll equal that guy. So 180 minus that minus 15, 144.81. So that means that this guy right here should be 144.81 degrees. Cool. Uh, but also, the total angle of a straight line is also 180. So I should say 180 minus that gives me 35.187. So I'll just go back over to here. This angle will be 35.187 degrees. Okay, let's move that. Whoa. Okay, well this right triangle here, we can figure out what X is with Sokotoa. All right, a little bit of Sokotoa. And um, we should do tangent, right? Sokotoa, opposite over hypotenuse, opposite over adjacent. This should be a tangent problem. So I'm gonna say that the tangent of theta, in this case that's 35.187 uh, degrees, it's gonna equal opposite, which is 1.8 over X. Opposite over adjacent, so 1.8 over x, which means that x should equal 1.8 1, 1 divided by the tangent of 35.187 degrees. Whoa. All right, so that means 1.8, I'm just doing this in my calculator now, of tangent of this, and that gives me 255 uh, 3? 2.553. All right, so this guy right here is 2.553. Let's write that down. Nice. But I'm not looking for 2.553. If you put that down, you're only going to get partial credit. That's only giving me the left side. I need the right side. Well, if this big guy is 5 meters, and this is 2.553 meters, this should be 5 minus that. So 5 minus that gives you 2.447. And that's the answer. Okay. So this should be 2.447. And we got it. Check your answer failed, of course, because this is... This is preview mode, it's not working so well, but no problem. All right, let's keep going. Number two, the Osaka Tigers basketball team play in a multi-level stadium. The most expensive tickets are in the first row, 
And the ticket price in yen for each row forms an arithmetic sequence. Prices for the first three rows are shown in this following table. What's the common difference? All right, so this shouldn't be too, uh, too bad because this wasn't that long ago that we were working on this. The common difference is how much it's going to change over time. So if it starts at 6,800, it's going to go down to 6,550. That means it is going down by 250, so negative 250. That's the common difference. Calculate the price of a ticket in the 16th row. All right. Now, if I were, if I were taking the IB exam right now, all right, I would remember my teacher's words, which is this. Okay. Let's do, that term is a little small. Let's do 12. You want to make a plan. All right. Uh, I, I've also told some people you want to think like a general. So since it said it's an arithmetic sequence, I would go to the formula booklet and look up the formula for the general term. And I'd probably want to write that down. I'd also probably want to write down, and we'll probably make this a little bit bigger. How about 16? I'd also probably want to write down the other formula that goes with it, which is the sum. The sum is n over 2, first term plus the nth term. Yeah, all right, so 16 is a little measure. Calculate the price of the 16th row. All right, well, I probably want to use this formula right here, where n is 16, you know. So n is 16. Uh, the first term, well, they give it to you, is 6,800. And the common difference was negative 250. So that means that I should type this in. So the 16th term should be the first term, 6,800, plus 16 minus 1 times the common difference. That's the 16th term. Okay, so that's what I should type in. 6,800 plus 16 minus 1 times negative 250. Nice. Now, this last one's a little bit tricky. Find the total cost of buying two tickets in, the, in each of the first of the 16 rows. I'm telling you the formula, and I'm reminding you, you got to buy two tickets per row. Well, all right, if I'm buying, you know, I'm adding up all of them, uh, what, would, what would the cost be to just buy one ticket per row? All right, well, it's going to be n over 2. n was 16. First term was 6,800, and the 16th term was just this guy, the 16th row. So 6,800 plus 16 minus 1 times negative 250. This is the cost of buying one ticket per row. I'm buying two, so I need to multiply this whole thing by two, and then you got it. Of course, the check answer button's being all mad, but uh, whatever. That's the idea. Number three. The Malvern Aquatic Center hosted a three-meter springboard diving event. The judges Stan and Minson awarded eight competitors out of t a score out of ten. The raw data is shown here. Write down the value of Pearson's R. No problemo. First things first, you want to go to mode and make sure that stat diagnostics is turned on. If it's not turned on, this is not going to work. So scroll all the way down to Stat Diagnostics and make sure that's on. Next, you're going to go to Stat Edit. So Stat Edit, and you're going to want to type in your stuff. So 4.13, 6, 4.3, 6, 7.1, 6, 7.5, 6. Then you go over to L2 and do it again. 4.7, 4.6, 4.8, 7.2, 7.3, 7.4, 7.5, 7.6. Great. To get the R value, you just go to Stat, Calc, Linear Regression, mm -hmm. L1 and L2. You might want to store the regression equations, so you go to Store, Reg, EQ, go to Alpha, F4, and type in Y1. Alpha, F4, and then Y1. And you calculate. Looks like my R value is 0 0.909. That's all you got to do. Using the value of R, interpret the relationship between Stans and Minson's score. That is very close to 1, 
So you'd say strong positive. If it were close to negative one, it would be strong negative. Write down the equation of the regression line. Okay, well, the regression line, uh, you can go to y equals and just report what that says. I'm looking at it. It says 1.1403x, basically, plus 0 0.578. Nice. Finally, use your regression equation from Part B to estimate min sun score when Stan awards a perfect 10. Okay, Stan's score is x. So what we're saying here is what happens when x equals 10? All right, what happens when x equals 10? No problem. You just go to the main page by second, second quit, alpha f4 y1, open parentheses 10, and you get 11.98. All right, by the way, is this a reliable score? Nope, definitely not, because that is extrapolation, to extrapolate a 10, uh, and that's a pretty big extrapolation, so it's not inside the data. It's pretty hard to make that call, but, you know, and that makes sense because we're saying that Minson is going to get a 12. The score only goes up to a 10, <laughs> so uh, not likely, <laughs> but we'll go with it anyway. All right, number four, Venn diagrams. These are not hard, but people make them very hard. Okay? So let's do this together one at a time. Okay. Cool. At Mirabuka Primary School, a survey found that 68% of students have a dog, 36% of students have a cat, 14% have both dog and cat. This information can be represented by this cool diagram. And we gotta find all the values, cool. Whenever you are doing a Venn diagram, the general rule is you wanna work from the middle out. Work from the middle of the diagram out. Now this guy says that 14% have both, so we'll put 14 right here. 14 for N, ooh, that's small, so let's, uh, delete that let's make I think 16 looks pretty good let's go back to that I think that looks nice whoa okay uh, moving right along 68 percent of students have a dog so that means this entire guy m plus n is going to equal 68 if 14 are on the right how many are left over on the left 68 minus 14 That'll be 54. Boom. 36, 36 have a cat. This whole circle has a cat. If 14 are on the left, how many percentage points are on the right? 36 minus 14. That will be 22. Finally. How many people don't have a dog or a cat? Well, it's percentage, so we can infer that that means 100. So 100 minus 22 minus 54 minus 14. We've got 10. So this final guy over here should be 10. Very cool. So 54, 14, 22, and 10. <clears throat> find the percentage of students who have a dog a cat or both again once the Venn diagrams ready this whole problem becomes a lot easier so it would just be all these guys added up right they have a dog or a cat or both not hard so that's 90 okay so B is 90 Find the probability that a randomly chosen student has a dog but does not have a cat. I mean, okay. That would be 54. So here are all the dogs. These are all the dogs, the dog guys that don't have a cat. It's 54. So again, once that Venn diagram is complete, I mean, reading this thing is not, not that bad. 
What's the probability they have a dog given that they do not have a cat? All right, once we have our Venn diagram, this is not a problem. Our new total for not having a cat is everything outside of the circle. So the new total is 54 plus 10, right? 54 plus 10 is everything outside of that. Now within that, what percentage of them have a dog? 54. So 54 over 64. 54 over 64. That's the probability that they have a dog but uh, don't have a cat. 54 plus 10 is 64. Number five. Carl has three brown socks and four black socks in his drawer. He takes two socks at random from the drawer. Complete the diagram, no problem. Notice they're giving a lot of this away. All right. Okay. Four black, three brown. I take one black sock out of the drawer. How many brown socks do I have? Three. Out of how many? Six. Right? If I take a black sock out of the drawer, how many black socks do I have? Three. Out of how many now? Six. That's it, because I took a black sock out. I did not put it back. All right? That's that guy. Find the probability that Carl takes two socks of the same color. All right, well, that's the probability he does brown, brown, plus taking black, black. All right? So what does that mean? Well, follow the tree diagram. It'll be 3 over 7 times 2 over 6, plus 4 over 7 times 3 over 6. Cool. All right. Given that Carl has two socks of the same color, find the probability that he has two brown socks. Okay. All right. This is just like what we did with that Venn diagram before. It's, it's n over the total. But now my total is going to be the probability I have two socks of the same color. So my new total is just going to be the guy I just wrote down. 3 over 7 times 2 over 6 plus 4 over 7 times 3 over 6. Now within that new total, what's the probability that I pick two brown socks? Well, it's this guy. 3 over 7 times 2 over 6. This is the one that has brown, brown. So my total would just be 3 over 7 times 2 over 6. That has to be the guy. Nothing, nothing doing there. Pretty simple. Okay. A factory produces bags of sugar with a labeled weight of 538 grams. The weights of the grams are distributed normally with this mean, 538, and a standard deviation of 5. What's the percentage of bags that weigh more than 545.5? No problem. Uh, ignore this 1.5 here. These are put down there for coding purposes, and I wasn't able to get rid of them. What are you going to do? All right. Whenever you are dealing with a probability or statistics question, it's always a good idea to draw a map of what is going on. In this case, a bell curve. So here's my bell curve. This guy right here is the mean, which is um, 538. All right. Uh, they have to weigh more than 545.5. So that's basically right here, and I'm weighing more than that. Right? Anything to the right. What does that mean? Well, this is going to be a normal CDF starting at 545.5 and going all the way to positive infinity. All right, so this is 545.5 right here, and I'm going to the right, which is positive infinity. So I'm going to go to second distribution, normal CDF. The lower bound is 545.5. The upper bound is positive infinity, so that's 1 EE99. The mean, again, is 538, and the standard deviation is 5. You can hit paste. 
And we get 0. 0.0668 for me. But you have to multiply by 100, so that's going to be 6.68. Now, going back to the scratch pad. A bag weighs less than 537.25 is rejected by the factory for being underweight. Find the probability that a randomly you know, chosen bag is rejected for being underweight. Well, again, going to want to make your map. I can use this bell curve again. I'll use blue, I guess. It's just to save time. All right, so 537.25, so that's kind of right here, and I'm going to the left now because it has to be less than 537.25. What's the probability? Well, it's going to be a normal CDF again. This time it's from negative infinity all the way up to 537.25. So in my calculator, I'm going to go to normal CDF. Lower bound is negative 1E99. Upper bound is that number, 537.25. Paste. I get 0.44. All right. Finally, a bag that weighs more than K grams is rejected by the factory for being overweight. The factory rejects 2% of bags for being overweight. What's the value of K? Okay. Well, again, I would make a nice map. That is the secret to all of these normal distribution problems. We'll kind of make a small one right here, I guess. Okay. Here's 538. And the upper 2%, so that means this guy right here is 0 0.02. That's the area of this, this guy on the right. And it's on the right. If I want to find this guy, I am going to need the other one which is inverse norm. This is the inverse CDF, inverse norm. Now the area is 0 0.02. If you have a TI-84 CE+, plus, there will be an option for left tail or right tail. Okay. Uh, 538. Standard deviation 5. Cool, cool. Um, so if you have uh, the yellow calculator, you'll do right tail. And when you get that, I get 548.26. Remember, the middle is 538. This number should be to the right, and it is 548.27 for me. So 548.27, very cool. Continuing. A college runs a mathematics course in the morning. Scores for a test from this class are shown below. Boom. For these data, the lower quartile is 62. The upper quartile is 88. Show that the test score of 25 would not be considered an outlier. What number would it have to be lower than? Well, this one is always going to be 1.5 uh, times the interquartile range past the upper and lower quartiles. And I'm telling you how to find the quartiles, but, you know, they give it to you here, which is nice. So... Uh, this should be 62 minus, 62 is the lower quartile, 1.5 times 88 minus 62. That's the interquartile range. Interquartile range is the upper quartile minus the lower quartile. So that should be the answer, whatever that is. The box and whisker diagram show these scores as given below. Very nice. And another mathematics teacher runs this guy, and he gets this guy. Okay. A researcher reviews the Boston Whisker diagrams and believes that the evening class performed better than the morning class. With reference to the Boston Whisker diagrams, state one aspect that may support the researcher's opinion and one that may counter it. Again, this is opinionated, okay? But I would also just point out that each of these guys is 25% of the data, all right? Each of these guys is 25% of the data. So an easy way to look at it is, all right, this guy is the top 50 percent all right so uh one the top 50 percent of evening class students did better than the top 50 percent of the morning class
right? That's obvious. So like 50% of them did like 82 or higher. These 50% only did like 74 or higher. So not as good. Um, on the other hand, what's a, what's a reason why you might say the morning class did better? Well, if you look, the bottom, let's see, why, why would the morning class be better? Well, uh, the bottom 50% did better than this bottom 50%. Right? I mean, like this third quartile right here, only like they did better than 54%, but this one did better than 62%. Likewise, the, bo the bottom most quartile, they did 25 or higher. This one did 18 or higher, like they did at least 18. So there's an argument that the bottom 50% of the morning class did better than the bottom 50% of the evening class. That would be one reason, well, you know, sim simple reasons why you could make the argument that they did better than the other guy. Number eight, the aircraft for a particular flight has 72 seats. The airline's records show that historically for this flight, only 90% of the people who purchased a ticket arrived to board the flight. They assume this trend will continue and decide to sell extra tickets and hope that no more than 72 passengers will arrive. This is true. They always oversell the tickets because people don't make it. All right? Either they can't make it because their, their one connecting flight was delayed or they get stuck in traffic or whatever. Like there's always attrition. So selling more is always better. You know? The number of passengers that arrive to board this flight is assumed to follow a binomial distribution. Either they make it or they don't make it, with a probability of 0.9. The airline sells 74 tickets for this flight. Find the probability that more than 72 passengers arrive to board the flight. Okay. Just like we did with that bell curve problem, we are going to make a map. All right. Always make a map. Always a good idea. In this case, my map is... A binomial one, so one, two, three, four, five. Uh, we'll say like 70, 71, 72, 73, and 74. That would be my map, all right? I want to circle the part of my map that I want. So it says, find the probability that more than 72 passengers arrived aboard the flight. So I'll circle the part that matters to me, which would just be this guy. Okay, no problem. So how do I get that? Well, there's several ways. One would be to just say the PDF is 73 plus the PDF of 74, that works. You can also just say, all right, the CDF of 74 minus the CDF of 72. That would also work. Does not matter to me. Uh, let's just do you know, the CDF route's always nice because you can just say one binomial CDF. I have 74 trials. Probably this is 0.9. This time my x value is 72. I get 0 0.0038. Nice. What's the expected number of passengers who will arrive to board the flight if 72 tickets are sold? Expected probability is always n times p. So in this case, if 72 tickets are sold, the probability is 0.9. It should be 72 times 0.9. What's the maximum number of tickets that could be sold if the expected number of passengers who arrive to board the flight must be less than or equal to 72? All right, so this one's a little tougher, okay? I just want to know, let me just pull up the scratch pad. The expected number is going to be 72, okay? That should equal n times p. But my probability is, of course, is 0.9. So that means I should do 72 divided by 0.9. 
which is approximately equal to what? So 72 divided by 0.9, I get 80. Actually, that exactly equals 80. So I need to sell 80 tickets in order to expect 72 passengers to arrive for my flight. So the answer should be 80. So again, this little bit of algebra, you can figure out that you need to sell 80 tickets in order to get basically, um, you know, 72 passengers to board your flight. Now, each passenger pays $150 for a ticket. If too many passengers arrive, then the airline will give $300 in compensation to each passenger that cannot board. Find to the nearest integer the expected increase or decrease in the money made by the airline if they decide to sell 74 tickets rather than 72. Okay, not bad at all. So first of all, we already know that um, if you sell more than 80 tickets, you're going to expect more passengers to arrive than you have seats, okay? So if this number were like 85, then there are gonna be a little more than, I don't know, maybe three passengers that need to be paid 300 bucks. But in neither of these cases, 74 or 72, are we actually going to give away any money? So just to make our lives a little easier, all you gotta do is say, all right, expected number of people to show up, that's 74 times 0.9, times how much money you're gonna make off each of them, times 150. That's how much money you're going to make if you sold 74 tickets. So 74 times 0 0.9 times 150. Uh, I get like 9,990. 9, okay. But they're comparing it to the other one. So when you, when you sell 72 tickets times 0 0.9 ti uh, times 150. Okay. So what happens if I change that to a 72? I get 9,720. 9, so that minus that, 270. So for $270, okay, you're gonna lose $270 if you sell 72 tickets as opposed to 74 tickets. All right, that's the main idea. So usually it's a good idea to sell 74 tickets as opposed to 72. You could make the argument, of course, that you run the risk of what if all 74 of them show up in which case, then you would have to sell some, you'd have to give some money away. But uh, that, w that one, we'd have to get a little bit more technical. We'd have to know what the standard deviation is for this distribution. And we'd have to do a little bit more of a nuanced uh, way of looking at the expected value. But in this case, a simple binomial distribution, not normal distribution, nothing crazy going on it's going to be $270 more on average if you sell 74. Number nine, McKenzie conducted an experiment on the reaction times of teenagers. A lot higher than mine, I'm sure. The results of the experiment are displayed in the following cumulative frequency graph. Very cool. Use the graph to estimate the median reaction time. No problem. So median reaction time means I am 50% of the way through the data. By looking at the y-axis, I see that I have 40 pieces of data. The median will be wherever I am halfway done. So halfway would be right about here. Just right about there. This is 0.52, 0.54, 0.56, 0.58. So the answer should be 0 0.58. What's the interquartile range of the reaction times? All right. Again, no big deal. The upper quartile will be 75% of 40. So if I'm looking at 30 here, I'm just leaning in a little closer. Whoa, it's because I'm using a mouse. It's 0.7, and the lower quartile will be, whoa. Point 0.42. So the interquartile range should be 0 0.7 minus 0 
What's the estimated number of teachers who have a reaction time greater than 0.4? All right, no problem. Uh, why don't we change the color just to be different? Okay, so here is 0.4 right there. there. So they have a reaction time greater than 0.4 seconds. So this is nine, but we're talking about the ones that are bigger. So how many are bigger than that? It'd be 40 minus nine, which is 31. 31. Determine the 90th percentile of the reaction times from the cumulative frequency graph. All right, no problem. In order to do this guy, We'll do that. Okay. What is 90% of 40? So 40 times 0 0.9, I get 36. So I need to go up to 36 right here. And then down. 0.8. So the 90th percentile is 0.8. No problem. Ooh, my allergies are crazy today. All right, number 10. Eduardo believes that there is a linear relationship between the age of a male runner and the time it takes for them to run 5,000 meters. To test this, he recorded the age X years, and the time, T minutes, for eight males in a single 5,000 meter race. His results are presented in the table and scatter diagram. Okay, 5K. Um, all right. These times are not great, but that's okay. You know, everybody tries. <laughs> for this data, find the value of the R value. Again, this is not hard. You type it into L1, you type it into L2. Stat calc one variable stats. And then you comment on that, and then you give me the regression equation. And it says type, type in when x is 57, and then you got the answer. So this one's just a repeat of uh, one we just did earlier. We're not gonna worry about too much about that. All right, Joey is making a party hat in the form of a comb. Ha, this one's a little hard. The hat is made from a sector, AOB, of a circular piece of paper with a radius of 18 centimeters blah, 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 blah. To make a hat, it has a base radius of 6.5. What is the perimeter of the base of the hat in terms of pi? Well, again, uh, we have to realize that this is a cone, okay? And that means the base of the cone is always going to be a circle. The perimeter of a circle has another name. It's called the circumference. Circumference is always 2 pi r. In this case, 2 pi times 6.5, or 13 pi, if you will. So this guy is going to be 13 pi. What's the value of theta in radians? Well, again, you're going to think outside the box here, but if I were to unfold this cone, this guy is going to be 13 pi. All right, that's what this whole dude is. All right, if I were in the middle of a test, I might say, you know what, I should probably write down some stuff that I might need. So you would flip to the part of the formula booklet that has something to do with sectors. The area of a sector is always going to be um, you know, what, what was it? Uh, it's theta theta over 2 pi times pi r squared. That's what it is. And arc length would be uh, theta over 2 pi times 2 pi r, which is just theta times r. Okay. In this case, the arc length is 13 pi. And theta we're looking for, and r is equal to 18. 
So all I really got to do is just divide both sides by 18 and then I'm done. So theta will be 13 pi over 18. No problem. Find the surface area of the outside of the hat. No problem. This one is going to require a little bit of thinking. Okay. If I want to find this guy, what do we call this curvy part of the cone? You know? What do we call this? Well, I don't know, but if I go in my formula booklet, you know, you'll find that there actually is a formula for that. And it's not that hard. The formula is going to be, um, sorry, so the area uh, of the curved part of a cone is equal to R times L. I think I put that in here, didn't I? Oh, pi RL, sorry, pi RL. Pi RL, which means that the area is going to be pi times the radius, which is 6.5. Now, what would L be? Well, let's look. Okay, this guy right here has something to do with this guy. Well, it would be 18, right? So this is where you got to think outside the box. I'm taking a piece of paper, that's 18 centimeters, and I glue these two guys together, and that's going to be this guy right here, which makes this length equal to 18. So the answer here should be 18, right there. Pi times 6.5 times 18. No big deal. Okay. This one's not hard. Ha, I'm going to butcher this name. Hafiza harvests 49 mangoes from her farm. The weights of the mangoes are shown in this group frequency table. Boom, 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 boom. What's the modal group? There's mean, median, and mode. Mode is the one that happens the most often. In this case, the modal group or modal class, if you will, is going to be this guy. 400 to 500 because that appears 16 times. That's more often than any of these other groups. So the modal group would be 400 to 500. Use your graphing display calculator to find an estimate of the standard deviation of the weights of the mangoes from this harvest. This one, just have to remember this part. I need to type it into my calculator. So I go to stat edit, clear out the data from before. L1, you are going to type in the middle number of each of these groups. You're going to type in the middle number of each one of these groups. So 150, 250, 350, 450, and 550. And in L2, you'll do your frequency table. So uh, 4, 7, 14, 16, and 8. Cool. To get the standard deviation, you go to stat, calc, one variable stats. You do have a frequency list, so you'll have L1 and L2. Hit calculate, and the standard deviation, which I think they want, the population standard deviation is 115.27. Nice. On the grid below, draw a histogram for the data in the table. Again, this is not hard. You say 4, 7, 14, 16, and 8. All right, they give it to you. So 4, 7, 14, 16, and 8. That should be it. So really nothing crazy going on there. Histograms are easy. Finally, number 13, we're going to be talking about some non-right triangle shenanigans. That's the last one. Very good. The following diagram shows a park bounded by a fence in the shape of a quadrilateral ABCD. Straight path crosses through the park from BD. And they give you these guys. Everything's displayed right here. Write down the value of angle BDC. 
BDC is this guy. <laughs> right here. Hey, all the angles of a triangle have to add up to 180. So you'd say 180 minus 41 minus 120, you get 19 degrees. So pull this up, 16. This guy right here, 19 degrees. Very cool. See around there. 19 degrees. Hence, use, using the triangle BDC to find the length of the path BD. So i got to find this guy. Well, this guy on the right is a non-right triangle, isn't it? And there are certain cool things you can do with non-right triangles. I'm looking for X, basically. If I'm given an opposite side with an opposite angle, I could use the sine rule. If I'm not, I, could, I have to do the cosine rule. Well. They give me 40 and 19 degrees. So, yeah, this is a sine rule. No problem. Sine rule is very simple. We actually already did it before. So sine of 19 over 40. And I'm looking for x. So this is going to be the sine of, let me do the fraction first. Sine of 120 over x. Okay, that means that x should equal uh, da, 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 40 times the sine of 120 over the sine of 19. Just doing some quick algebra there. And that is going to approximately equal what? Let's type it in. 40 times the sine of 120 over the sine of 19. I get 106.401. Very cool. So that's this guy, 106.401. Let's go ahead and write that in there, shall we? So we can delete that guy. Just jot that in there. 106.402, basically, because that, that 7 actually rounds it up. So this is 106.401-ish. That's good. Very nice. Calculate the size of BAD. Correct to uh, five significant figures. B, A, D. All right, so now we're looking at this left triangle. This one, they don't give us any angles at all. So we need to do the cosine rule. Cosine rule is not that bad. To find a missing angle, you must use this guy. All right, C will equal the cosine inverse of... All right, C squared, so that's the one that's opposite the angle we want, minus 85 squared, minus like A squared, minus B squared, basically. All over negative 2 times, you know, A times B, basically, so 85 times 85. And that's going to equal what? So, all right, let's type it into our calculator. So cosine inverse, I'll make a fraction. All right, that squared minus 85 squared minus 85 squared all over negative 2 times 85 times 85. I get 77.495. Degrees. Okay, might as well write that down right here. 77.495 degrees. Awesome. Put that, scoop that up right there. Looks nice. Last question. Find the area bounded by the path BD, AB, and AD, meaning I need to find this area on the left. There is an area of a triangle formula that we should use. Area of a triangle formula, in this case, is 1 half 
A times B times the sine of the angle in between them. In this case, that's going to be 1 half 85 times 85 times the sine of 77.495 degrees. And that's going to approximately equal what? 1 half 85, 85 times the sine of 77.495. I get 3526.81. Three, five, two, six, point, basically 807. Very nice. That is the area of the last triangle, and we're done. That is the entire uh, review guide. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, take care and have a good day. Bye-bye.